Good morning. My name is Chair Chung. I'm here to present how I do it for renal artery exposures as a part of the APEX or Advanced Practical Exposures and Vascular Surgery course. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Smeds and Dr. Bath for the kind invitation and opportunity to present. So I have no relevant disclosures. So first of all, why is this important? Uh, can't I just stent the renal artery, whatever the problem is? Um, and I think usually you can, uh, but there are a few exceptions to this. One is for pediatric anomalies. Um, while there are some stents, um, balloon expandable stents that you can serially dilate in the pediatric population, as well as covered stents, um, you, they're, they're not ideal. Um, for growing with the patient, um, instead using some sort of bypass with autogenous conduit that can grow with the patient uh, for those pathologies is usually ideal. Also, you need some sort of bailout if there's a failure of the renal artery stents, uh, as this is especially true in the era of FIVARs and uh, ch chimney EVARs, um, as well as after failed interventions for stenotic lesions. I would submit that it's probably a little bit worse after FIVAR or CHIVAR simply because the stents tend to extend into the renal artery a little bit further than for stenotic lesions. Uh, but still for both of these, um, getting out further distal on the renal artery um, to do a bypass is still critical. Also for certain renal artery aneurysms that are unamenable to coil embolization or overstenting. Um, this is a picture of one uh, that I have recently treated. Um, this one has a particularly wide neck as well as it's pointing directly anterior. So it's hard to get the appropriate angle and even see how to get the coil into the aneurysm sac. Um, and then finally for trauma, I think this is also an important indication uh, to know how to expose the renal artery and fix it should you need to. So in terms of anatomy, how do the how do I learn this and what reference do I use? I use uh, Dr. Valentine's book. Dr. Valentine is a master surgeon and over his decades of experience um, doing multiple uh, open surgeries, he's, he's concisely condensed them and provided outstanding illustrations in his book, Anatomic Exposures and Vascular Surgery. And I would highly recommend this to anybody uh, who wants to learn more about the renal artery anatomy and how to fix it. Um, but just some brief uh, high points from his uh, chapters in this. Um, usually the renal arteries, the osteas are located roughly at the L1 and L2 interspace within gerotus fascia. It's going to be located behind the spleen and the tail of the pancreas on the left. And on the right, it's located behind the duodenum and hepatic flexure of the colon. Um, this highlights um, the reason why it's uh, critical to know how to do this. Um, usually a lot of the lesions that we're treating are a little bit more distal, way further distal um, than had been previously treated for just osteal disease. Um, as you can see here, um, it's way within the parenchyma actually of the kidney, the corresponding lesion that we're trying to treat. This is where the aneurysm had been coming off. So in terms of incisions, uh, in order to get exposures, there's multiple incisions that you can use. Um, uh, from the supine position, I think this is the easiest. You can um, access both the inflow and the outflow uh, of your intended repair. Um, you can choose a midline incision. You can use a transverse supra umbilical incision. Um, and this affords a great amount of exposure, both proximally and distally, even though it's a less commonly used incision in adults. You can use a subcostal incision as well um, to, in order to access the renal artery. Um, and some pros and cons of each of the exposures. Um, the midline exposure I think is, is excellent for me in my hands. Um, one is that I'm used to it. And second, it affords me the ability to expose both proximally and distally further on the aorta should I need it and mobilize a lot of the other uh, peritoneal contents out of the way. It gives me more room to sweep everything out of the way should I need to do that. Um, and so my personal preference is either the midline incision or the transverse supra umbilical incisions. So after I've made my incision, um, 
what I like to do is mobilize the retroperitoneum. Um, and the reason why is the midline exposure of the aorta is excellent for clamping, but it's not as good for doing a bypass, especially for distal pathologies. And so in order to expose that distal part of the renal artery, I want to really um, expose the entire kidney all the way out to the parenchyma. And for that, um, mobilizing retroperitoneum is key. Um, start with the white line of Tolt. Try to stay anterior to Gerota's fascia. Um, and on the right, um, you can do a, a cochra maneuver, mobilize the duodenum in the head of the pancreas. And on the left, um, mobilize the splenophrenic and splenorenal ligaments in the tail of the pancreas and rotate everything over. You can leave the spleen down if you wish, um, but I've always found it a bit easier to lift the spleen up and just sort of get all of the pancreas, et cetera, out of the way. And then there's multiple options to reconstruct once you have everything exposed, uh, either on the right or the left. Um, you, you can go pretty much wherever you want. Once you have the retroperitoneum mobilized and the aorta exposed, as well as your distal target exposed, you can go in an anti-grade fashion, you can go in a retrograde fashion, you can come off the aorta, you can come off the major visceral vessels of the, uh, that come off of the aorta, either a splenorenal bypass or a hepatorenal bypass. Um, I personally prefer um, the branches uh, off the celiac axis in order to do my bypasses. And the reason why is they're so short. Um, they tend to stay open really well. Once you have the retroperitoneal exposure done, it's sitting right there for you. And so um, those are my, I, I think, ideal. Um, it does go against the, the principle that many people are taught, i.e. go where you get the best inflow, which is your aorta. But um, this is simply just easier, and I found the patency to be outstanding for these patients. Um, retraction is key. Um, for me, uh, I've taught, been taught to use the Omni Retractor system, and the things that I need the most are the two renal vein retractors, um, a wide malleable, a medium malleable, and two splanchnic retractors. Um, the position of each of these, um, the renal vein retractors are on the renal veins. Um, the wide malleables and the medium malleables I have on the intestines and the duodenum, and that, that's what's holding everything off of the aorta. And the two splanchnic retractors help to hold back uh, some of the abdominal wall. Um, case planning is critical for these uh, patients. I think um, for me, it's CTA and Terra Recon. This allows me to size. Uh, the vessels um, and understand the relationships uh, with other surrounding anatomic structures a bit better. I can rotate everything around. Um, vein mapping is also key, especially for the pediatric cases uh, where the greater saphenous vein may not be what you want and instead you may have to use some other conduit. Other conduits that you can use, six millimeter Dacron, rifampin soaked uh, Dacron usually. Um, or allograft, um, especially for infected cases. This is a, an example of one of the cases that I've done recently. Um, this shows uh, a cryopreserved uh, thoracic piece here. And then I used an aorta, bifurcated aorto iliac piece with a femoropopliteal limb. So this went ultimately to the right renal artery, and this went to the celiac SMA and the left renal artery. Some pitfalls to avoid, um, and especially for occlusive disease, you're going to have some significant lumbar arteries that are, um, that are prominent. Um, you'll have to avoid uh, injuring those, as well as the adrenal branches and granatal branches. Um, these all often have to be um, either avoided entirely or simply divided and ligated in order to get access to where you need to go. And then, as well as uh, management of the renal vein. Um, so what I try to do is I try to preserve the renal vein. Um, but if I have to um, divide them, I try to pick just one to limit the renal venous hypertension. Um, and ideally, if, if you do have to um, take some of the branches, you want to take as many as you can in order to mobilize the vein fully and expose the artery as much as you need to do. Um, other pitfalls, um, look for a history of urinary retention. This was a complication that I had in the past um, when I was trying to get very distal on the kidney. The one thing I forgot about was the, the renal calyces. Um, and in patients with a history of urinary retention, the calyx of the kidney can become very distended, very thin, 
be very difficult to dissect. And what I inadvertently had done is uh, cause a brief injury to it and cause a uh, urinoma afterwards. So some of the things that you want to look for um, before, before doing these cases is the history that you see below. Outlet obstructions, poor bladder emptying, or medications can also cause some urinary retention. And these are some of the medications that can do that. Anastomosis, I prefer end-to-end -end, um, anastomoses. Uh, endocides, you can if you want, but end-to-end, uh, -end, I think, has just been easier the way it just sets up for you. Um, 6 -O or 7 -O prolines, depending on the size of the renal arteries. And again, I use two sutures, um, anchoring them at 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock and coming around um, and, and anastomosing them to each other. Uh, renal preservation and other adjuncts. Um, I use mannitol, uh, 25 grams IV prior to clamping. Um, I do heparinize all my patients, 100 units per kilogram, and afterwards I do use protamine. Um, after this big retroperitoneal uh, exposures, usually um, there, there's a lot of raw surface and the protamine helps to, to prevent um, some retroperitoneal hematomas after you, you've uh, decompress this space a little bit. Ex vivo repairs. Um, ex vivo repairs uh, do for repairs that I think are going to take longer than 40 minutes uh, of warm ischemia time. Um, there's several keys to doing the ex vivo repair. Um, one is using a vessel loop or a soft plastic bulldog on the ureter, which you preserve. Um, and this is to prevent uh, collateral back bleeding. Um, they, there's some very small ureteral branches that feed back into the renal artery. Um, and if you don't clamp these, they'll reperfuse the renal artery and warm the kidney, uh, which is what you want to try and avoid. Um, I, I do this with my transplant colleagues, and they use a perfusate that matches the intracellular composition of electrolytes. Um, so that remains balanced. You want to chill to about 5 to 10 degrees uh, centigrade and use a plastic bag with the ice to try and get the goal uh, core temperature of the kidney. Um, outcomes of aorta renal bypasses, outstanding. Um, this is uh, data taken from Dr. Hansen's annals of surgery patient, uh, annals of surgery paper um, over 20 years ago. And he looked at uh, 720 total uh, renal reconstructions uh, with a variety of conduits with vein being the most common. And this was done for um, hypertension as well as to prevent uh, dialysis uh, with those treated uh, for hypertension being most successful. You had a 90% uh, success rate um, with uh, renal artery bypasses for hypertension. In contrast, for patients uh, that were trying to do this for improved uh, renal function, you only had about a 30 to 60 percent uh, success rate. But the patency of the renal artery bypasses are outstanding. So what he did here is compare the native renal artery untreated versus those that um, had a bypass. And what you can see is the bypasses, um, as shown by the dotted line at the top, had a markedly superior patency to um, the natural history of disease untreated um, renal arteries that he had in other comparison patients that refused operation. He only had to re-intervene on 3.7% uh, of his patients. So these bypasses are outstanding, very durable. So with that, I'll close. Uh, thank you again to Dr. Smeds and Dr. Bath for the opportunity to present.